desires with one's condition in the trouble in, in the trouble of many worries and amidst unsatisfied needs could easily become a great temptation to transgress one's duties. But even without taking note of duty, all human beings have already of their own the most powerful and intimate inclination to happiness, as it is just in this idea that all inclinations unite in one son. Okay, so this is the case where we have an empirical, he just assumes, we have an empirical inclination to do certain things, whatever it is that we just happen to desire. We also have at least an indirect duty to our own habits to satisfy our desires and inclinations, our empirical desires and inclinations. Because we human beings, when we become very unhappy, often are going to be tempted away from duty. So that's why it's an indirect requirement to avoid temptations away from our duty. However, he says, the prescription of happiness is predominantly such that it greatly infringes on some inclinations, and yet human beings can form no determinate and reliable concept of the sum of the satisfaction of all under the name happiness. Which is why it's not surprising that a single inclination, if determined with regard to what it promises and to the time is time its satisfaction can be obtained, can outweigh a wavering idea that a human being is going to be tempted by sort of immediate inclinations even when it conflicts with their overall happiness. Okay, so notice first of all here um, that um, our, as we saw before, our empirical desires, the inclinations we happen to have, can be thought of as combining into a total sum that he calls happiness. And so we have an indirect duty to avoid this kind of temptation. Um, and so he does not, not, does not think that our empirical desires, our feelings are irrelevant to morality. They are relevant. They, they are a matter of great concern to us. And indeed, they are a matter of moral concern to us. Um, because we have to have our empirical feelings, we have to have our inclinations and desires maybe structured properly. Otherwise, we're going to be tempted to do wrong. But our inclinations and desires are not relevant to the grounding or justification of the fundamental principle of morality. Um, and that's what we're interested in. Um, so remember that duty is what we get when we combine uh, the ideas of pure practical reason with creatures like us who have empirical desires and inclinations, which may not agree with what pure practical so, I want to read you a passage from the Metaphysics of Morals, um, where he's talking about a similar, making a similar point. So this is um, in the Doctrine of Virtue. This is in the Metaphysics of Morals. We'll read probably not this passage, but um, other material later on. He says, and, and, and this, I'm emphasizing this because it goes against the um, misleading picture of Kant. Here. He says, the rules for practicing virtue aim at a frame of mind that is both valiant and cheerful in fulfilling its duties. For virtue not only has to muster all the forces to overcome the obstacles it must contend with, it also involves sacrificing many of the joys of life, the loss of which can sometimes make one's mind gloomy and sullen. So doing the right thing being moral, being virtuous, sometimes means denying our empirical inclinations. And this can make us what? Sad. But, he says, what is not done with pleasure, but pleasure, empirical satisfaction, but what is not done with pleasure, but merely as compulsory service, has no inner worth for one who attends to his duty in this way. So, if I'm constantly um, chafing at my duty, 
if my desires are constantly, my empirical desires, my inclinations are constantly in conflict with what duty requires, I'm going to be gloomy and sullen. What is not done with pleasure, but merely as compulsory service, is no inner worth for me. I'm not going to feel satisfied. For one who attends to his duty in this way, and such service is not loved by him. Instead, he shirks as much as possible occasions for practicing virtue. So we have to try to develop our empirical desires to track what duty requires, to try to be in agreement with it, so that we're not tempted away from it. So, one last time, Kant is not saying that in order to be virtuous, you have to, you have to act contrary to your inclinations. Uh, if your inclinations are contrary to duty, you have to do what duty requires. But it would be better if your inclinations were in agreement. Then you could be both virtuous and happy. That wouldn't make you a, have a better character. It would make you happy. And that's better. Not a better person, just a better world. OK. Um, let, me, let me quickly talk about um, what he calls the second proposition. So this is on 15. Um, right above 400, so 399. It says, the second proposition is this. It says, an action from duty has its moral worth not in the purpose that is to be attained by it, but in the maxim according to which it's resolved upon. OK, um, so this isn't much of a surprise, but you might be wondering what the first proposition is. He didn't tell us. Um, and this is a good question. Um, the most common answer that commentators give something like this, I mean, it's what we've just been talking about, something like this. An action is good, has moral worth, when it's done from duty rather than merely from it. Um, and the point of the second proposition is simply that the maxim is the basis for assessment, not simply the um, not simply the purpose, not simply the outward manifestation of the action. Um, so I want to quickly give um, the examples from the editor's introduction. So here are three maxims. Um, and intuitively speaking, um, one and three are perfectly permissible maxims to act on. So one says, I will keep my weapon because I want it for myself. So there's the inclination, a desire I happen to have. And it's perfectly fine to act on that, on that incentive in keeping my weapon because it's mine. And then notice that in the second case, I will keep your weapon because I want it for myself. Here's a, this is not an okay maxim. But notice that the incentive here is the same. The action is different, but the incentive is the same, namely the inclination I have. I want it. The third now has the same action as the second. But the incentive is different. The reason why I'm keeping your weapon is different. It's not because I happen to want it, but because you've gone mad and may hurt something. So I recognize it's my duty to protect other people by holding on to your weapon. OK, so the point is that one and two have the same action with different incentives. Two and three um, have, sorry, I said that wrong. Um, one and two have the same incentive but different actions. Two and three have the same action but different incentives. Let me say this one more time. So um, 
one is okay, two is not, despite the fact that they have the same incentive. So the action matters to our moral assessment. Two and three have the same action but different incentives. Two is not okay, three is okay. So the action itself is not enough to determine whether the maximum is okay, the incentive matters also. So the point is simply this. Uh, in order to determine whether a maximum is good or not, whether a maxim is permissible or not, we have to look at both the action and the incentive. It's, the assessment is not based on either one alone, but somehow the combination of the action and the incentive, the action and the reason why. Yeah. Um, so is it really a case of the duty to not steal or people not use as well? Um, so this is supposed to be like in, intuitively that this is okay because even if you're holding on to something that belongs to somebody else, it's because you're protecting other people who are born. So um, we haven't yet seen what makes something a duty. We're still supposed to be working from our ordinary moral understanding. Okay, so the second proposition is that moral worth is not in the purpose itself, not in the action itself or the end itself but um, the max, which includes both the purpose, the action, and the incentive somehow combined. Okay, so next time we will um, see what makes a maxima good. Next time is going to be sort of the heart of Kantian ethics.